Next, we have a great talk from Rajat Monga, the co-creator of TensorFlow, on how AI is eating all of software. Hello, everyone. I'm Rajat Monga, and here to talk a bit about AI. So this here is a deep neural network, uh, something you've probably heard a lot about, especially if you're here today. So this one, as you can see, it has all these different layers where it's uh, taking inputs, learning each layer, sort of applies a function to that and goes through all the way, makes prediction, learns from that. And this is really one of the core algorithms behind what we see as the success of AI over the last decade. Uh, in addition to these algorithms, you know, there are a few other things that have come together to make this possible. Here's one example. So, you know, many of you may have heard of ImageNet. This is basically a data set with uh, millions of images across lots of different classes that have been trained on to really improve the, you know, the state of the art on many of the vision models that we have today. Uh, so that's sort of number two, uh, putting the data together. In fact, uh, data's sort of become so important here that you'll see things like this. If you are, uh, you know, hopefully you're not stopping a car uh, and getting the stop sign wrong while they're actually running their stuff. But data is really, you know, making a big difference in how far or how fast AI is making a progress in. So uh, the third piece of these, once you have the algorithms and the data together, is how fast can you train these models on all the data set that we are creating here? And that's where the computational power comes in. You know, what you see here is a TPU part. It's actually a generation older than where we are today. Uh, but this is already 100 plus petaflops with lots and lots of memory. And you can see a pretty amazing supercomputer. It would probably be just based on this, one of the fastest supercomputers in the world at this time. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the third thing. This is the computational power that we've seen coming together. And in fact, as these three things come together, that's really, uh, you know, change the name of the game with AI and being helped with tools like TensorFlow. And I was uh, you know, glad to be a part of the team that you know, built this and drove this uh, for a while. So it was, it was really exciting to see the change or the impact that this has been making. Now let's go back a bit in, over the last decade to see what, what's uh, happened during this time. If you kind of squint on this, you'll see something that looks like a cat. And the reason is we learned from a lot of YouTube videos, and of course, who hasn't seen a YouTube video without a cat with a cat? Uh, so lots of good stuff, uh, scaled on tons of machines, 16,000 CPU cores back in 2011. And that allowed us, our network, to really learn to recognize cats automatically without telling it what a cat is, what a dog was, and so on. So that, that was pretty cool about this one. Uh, now, as we go along, over the, around the same time in 2012, as deep learning was taking off, uh, folks over in Toronto, some students along with Professor Hinton basically came together and tried, okay, can you run this new kind of, not really new kind of model, but these kind of models, can you scale them up and run them on really large data sets like ImageNet? Before that, people were really programming and coming up with very custom features to build things like this. So when they did this, they, they showed a huge improvement on anything before. And this really started to change the game on how people were thinking about deep learning at this time. Over the next year or so uh, at Google, we were applying this in lots of different areas, building new kinds of models. This is what came to be known as Google Net. Uh, again, applying similar kind of ideas with convolutional nets, scaling across lots of different machines. And what this led to, what all these improvements in different things really led to improvements in products themselves. So if uh, you know, any of you have heard about Picasa, which was almost like a precursor to Google Photos a while back, that, that was a piece of software where uh, you could really organize your pictures and you could manage them and you could label them yourself. You could put, you know, saying, oh, these are pictures from my uh, last family vacation and so on. So you could organize things like that. What Google Photos did was, you know what, all that organization that you had to do manually is now gone. You can just get things because you can search for them. It understands what the images are. It understands what the pictures that you're taking are. And that's really, you know, changed the game in terms of, uh, all kinds of photo processing or image processing things that we were doing then. 
course, uh, when you're searching for pictures, why type it out when you can speak it out? And so that, that was another area where we're seeing lots of advances around the same time. Uh, in this case, again, using the same technology, deep neural networks, uh, that's been the underpinning of a lot of this, we saw where moving from the old style uh, methods, which were also you know, somewhat learned, but somewhat programmed, to these uh, fully trained networks allowed us to do like huge improvements, you know, more than 20% error rate improvements over what was possible in the past. And what that changed was uh, from being a research topic or being used in like very, very specific places, speech recognition became mainstream where we can now, you know, talk to our phones and do all kinds of things. You know, you probably have a Google Assistant or an Alexa or Siri somewhere that you've used before. Uh, of course, that was step one. They, they've, since then, there have been you know, lots more improvements. The next one was this uh, new kind of uh, architecture, LSTMs that was applied to speech around that time, and that, that included uh, that led to another 10% improvement on top of that. And we, we've continued to see those huge advances since then. Now, uh, of course, when you think about speech, the you know part of the speech recognition is just to convert, okay, what you're saying to text, but you also need to understand that text. And that's where, uh, you know, over the last several years, we've seen a lot more advances in natural language processing as well. Uh, started sort of with the, the BERT style of models and transformers, where, uh, you know, this research led to, again, huge improvements in what could be done with natural language. And again, in this case, the data and the computer was as important. So the data set, there was a Q&A data set that came out of Stanford and people started to optimize things and really learned from that. That led to some of these, and for folks of you, those of you who've been sort of involved in this area or have looked at this area, of course, more recently, there's GPT-3 that, that has shown even more advances as well. Of course, let's see uh, where people are using this. What can we do with this? And so one great example is Google search itself. You may be familiar with the page rank kind of algorithm. You know, that's one of the first algorithms that really started Google. That, that's what Google was based on when it started out. Since then, there've been lots of changes and additions. Uh, a lot of them manual, a lot of them, you know, just programmed in terms of combining different kinds of rules together to uh, get better results in search itself. As you can see, you know, th this example really shows how just an advancement in terms of, you know, applying an algorithm like this, like BERT, deploying that in search, went from just matching the basic keywords, which, which was okay, but it wasn't really getting the context of what the user wanted. And the one on the right, it really shows how it gets, once it gets the context, it can really answer those so much, much better. Uh, of course, these are not the only areas. You know, we often think about all of these running in uh, deep learning and other algorithms being very, very expensive. So they run in huge servers on the data center. That's often true, but, but with recent advances, it's been possible to really bring them down and run them on really small devices, including your phones. So in fact, you know, very likely whatever phone you have, if you've bought it in the last few years, it's running some kind of deep learning models. In fact, this example here shows uh, a model being applied to really get a better picture after you've taken it. And some of this can be done with your camera that's integrated on like pixel phones, for example, uh, where it blurs the background combining not just your lenses, but also, a whole bunch of smartness in terms of figuring out what's the foreground from the background as well. Uh, and you know, on the phone itself, there's given that now we can get things in that small form factor, there's so much more that can be done. For example, here, there are places where you can't always hear the audio or maybe you have trouble hearing audio and being able to live caption things like that automatically just on your device without worrying about anything else just makes a huge difference. Uh, so, Thinking about, you know, there's a lot of consumer stuff that we've talked about in, in phones. Of course, to show you the right things, the right applications that you want to use, uh, companies like Google, you do a lot of machine learning behind the scenes to recommend the right pieces. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on here as well. In this case, uh, there was a recommender system that really took information about the user, all the different things that could be recommended and decided, okay, what should be recommended to this user when he comes on, he or she comes on next. And in this case, we saw, you know what, this is great. There's a lot of stuff that goes on to, to put all those pieces together. And 
you know, this was deployed, was doing great. But then when people started looking at what's happening, they realized, uh, you know, one of the big differences was what was being run or trained on in the data center was different from what was eventually being run and executed to make the recommendations. And just fixing that one thing led to a huge improvement, that 2% improvement in, in this particular case. And so, you know, as you think about how all these pieces come together and they're made possible, there's a lot of different pieces that really need to be done for uh, making this possible. There's so many different things to make this model work, not just you know get all the compute and the algorithm together. And so there, there, you know, these are some of the pieces that you see right here. In fact, there are tools you know around TensorFlow that have been built to really solve for this. Uh, that whole ecosystem called TensorFlow Extended, with all these different pieces that all the way from uh, validating data, ingesting it, processing it, building the models, deploying in production, and really to help folks take care of that. And that's really to help uh, you know, bring AI into more and more things across the board. So you know, we're clearly seeing lots of advances in this and we're seeing uh, lots of applications of that as well. Of course, not all is great with AI and so there are a number of issues with AI as well and wanted to just uh, talk about a couple just to make sure we're mindful of it when we think about AI and, and do things at our end. So, so one, for example, you know, with uh, you know, as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. There's a lot of power in terms of, you know, say identifying faces and doing recognition and so on. But that can be used in all kinds of ways and not always in a good way. If you think about uh, cameras all over the world, uh, most cities today have cameras deployed in different places, uh, whether it's uh, in the eastern side or, or in the west. There are so many different cameras that can be used in different kinds of ways to recognize people and do different kinds of things. We need to be really responsible and thoughtful in how we want to use them as well. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. Uh, so as you saw here, uh, there's this opportunity to change things or how they look. And over the last several years, we've been talking about fake news in lots of different contexts. And the ability to really make things look so real has never been possible before now. This just makes that problem harder. And we have to be really careful about how we use this technology in good ways as well. So talking about you know, issues, those are some of the issues that AI is bringing. But in broadly, you know, stepping back, there are lots of different challenges that humanity faces as a whole today. I'll, I'll talk about one of them, you know, energy. If you think about how much energy we use, you know, here's a number here, a million terajoules. One way to think about it is, let's think of energy required to boil a ca single kettle of water. Now think of 8 billion people boiling that kettle of water every single minute, round the clock, all the time. That's really how much energy we are using every single day. And today, that's really coming from lots of fossil fuels, really, you know, hurting us in lots of ways. You know, of course, with climate change and the heating heat that's causing, uh, you know, all not all is not bad. In that, this is one area where perhaps AI can help. There are lots of you know renewable areas, renewable energy sources that we are working on, uh, solar and wind being one. And from simple things like just looking at, okay, how can we uh, repair these windmills? How can we 
find the turbines and the problems with them sooner to uh, forecasting the solar and the wind power sooner and much better allows us to make a lot more progress and allows us to use these more effectively and efficiently towards a much better future. And uh, so really what I want to end with is AI is really making a difference and uh, you know it has a huge possibility for impact. Thank you.